Good evening. It's great to be with you guys tonight. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Calvary. It's pretty incredible. 15 years ago today, I visited Calvary for the very first time and preached here for the very first time as a guest speaker. And uh, that was a Sunday back in 2008. And um, one of the funny stories that came of that, I just came here as a guest speaker and had some conversations. At that time, the church was not a senior pastor. I had some conversations about becoming the senior pastor, but it was all very preliminary, and I thought it wasn't going to work out and, and wasn't all that interested, actually, and uh, was very content where God had us in ministry at the time back east. And as we were here and as I preached, just found the, the congregation here at Calvary from some of the stuff they'd gone through in the year and a half before that, hungry and hurting as a people of God. And it really stirred something in me. And so I had some further conversations with the elders and they invited me to come back two weeks later. And then uh, what happened was we moved here. Now, can you imagine your first time ever to a place, January 20th, and you actually move here September 12th, bring your family, 14-year-old, 12-year-old, 9-year-old, across the country and you land. And we came here then in the fall. And so in September, I've been here as the senior pastor for 15 years. But this is the 15th anniversary of my speaking here for the very first time. So it's kind of cool to be able to speak to you guys. Uh, to speak to the next generation that is so vibrant and a part of who we are as a church and so important who we are, it's so good to speak to you. Now, when I came here, one of the weird things compared to where I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in northern Indiana, about an hour and a half out of Chicago, so I'm a huge Chicago Cubs fan, just got to go to a Cubs game a couple weeks ago uh, when we were visiting Chicago, but I grew up in a setting and a family, my parents and their parents, and we just weren't families of a lot of hugging when you saw each other, it was kind of, even my own family, I grew up in a setting where um, my dad didn't say, I love you, or were a lot of hugging, but you, he believed you showed love by your actions. And so when I came here that first weekend, Leslie and I were here, my wife and I were here, and uh, it was interesting because I met some of the elders and some of the staff and some of the behind the scenes people, and everybody would walk up and hug me, and they were perfect strangers, and it was so uncomfortable to me. It just felt awkward and weird and strange. And I communicated that to the executive pastor at the time, Curtis Johnson. And it was so funny, when he came back two weeks later, some elders were in a meeting and discussing what I guess they were gonna to talk to me about. And I came up into the office area and they came out of the office and Curtis must have talked to them in between because they all reached out their hands and kind of said, hello, good to have you back with us. And it was this all of a sudden handshakes and not hugging. And uh, I grew up in a setting where there was a lot of brokenness in our home. My mom had a traumatic brain injury. She was in a car accident when she was 14, was knocked unconscious for three months, and had to learn to walk and talk and everything all over again as a 14-year-old. Uh, went to back, tried to go back to school after that accident, and uh, the principal told her on the second day she couldn't stay in school because she was too slow because she was learning to walk all over again. She couldn't get to her classes fast enough. And since she was always late, she'd have to drop out. Can you imagine someone telling someone that today in school, that you've got, you've got too much of a disability, you can't come to class, you might as well just drop out, which she ended up doing, dropping out of school, because they said, you just can't come to class. And my mom then continued into life with a lot of emotional and physical troubles and mental health issues. She had big personality swings. And so then when my mom and dad got married, had my, me, the older brother, and then my br younger brother, Troy, who's a pastor on our team here, uh, who's three years younger than me, she brought into our home a lot of chaos because she could be really calm one minute and then throwing and screaming and, and doing all kinds of stuff and then calm again and a few times she was institutionalized in, in uh, mental health uh, facilities. And my, my um, dad was a factory worker. Both mom and dad loved Jesus, and they tried as much as they could. And it was a very complicated home to grow up in. And I love my parents dearly. And, but it was a setting where, again, we weren't real huggy, and we weren't real close. And so I wrote a memoir in 2016 uh, it's called All But Normal Life on Victory Road, that just the story of growing up in a Christian home that was affected by traumatic brain injury and how that impacted my life and told some of the stories in there. And, and uh, uh, some folks think it's a very funny story, which has some funny points. It has some very hurtful. The night my mom was taken out of our home was a really chaotic and broken time when the police came and windows were crashed and my mom was just having a breakdown. It just was a very hard night. And I was like... Uh, 
about 14 years old and just sort of ask God, why am I in this house? Why couldn't I have been born into another family? Just a very difficult time. And so our, our, in that memoir, I talked about how we weren't real huggy. We didn't hug much. And, and that I think my brother and I both kind of went away from that people who don't hug anybody and don't reach out that way, and uh, wrote about how we kind of got that from our parents. It kind of was passed down from us not to be that affectionate with hugs, to even the people closest to you in your home. And my dad read the book, and I was a little nervous about what my dad would say about the book. As a matter of fact, we had a copy, of advanced copy, FedEx to him from the publisher, and, and uh, when he, he called me the next day, he read it like in the first day. You know, and it takes like you know eight or nine hours to sit down and read the book. And he, he read it the first day, and he let me know. He left a voice message. I have some corrections. Uh, but what was interesting was he never mentioned some of the stuff about that they didn't learn to hug from my parents. They didn't pass that down to us. That just wasn't a part of our family culture. And then um, when the book came out. My brother and my dad and I went on a little, we went to a few places where we lived and did some book signings, went to some bookstores and things and, and spent a few days together doing that. And then we were getting ready to leave my dad, my brother and I, and my dad all of a sudden said, kind of like, bring it in, fellas. And he reached out and he hugged us. And this is the picture of my dad just leaning into us to hug us. And I've never hugged him again since then, uh, eight years later. No, we, we actually have. It's, it's, now it's become kind of awkward because we've done this now. And so sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But, you know, I really admire my dad for actually reading the book, not complaining to me, but just thinking, okay, then I'll lean in next time and hug these guys. And I know that was different for him. And what I appreciated my dad, about my dad is he, he chooses to grow in the midst of all the chaos in our home. I watched my mom and dad both love Jesus, seek to worship Jesus, serve Jesus, and become like Jesus, even in all the imperfections and all the chaos that went on in our home. And sometimes we get this idea in our culture, in our lives, and with the brokenness and just the things we come out of with our parents, because I got news for you, nobody in this room's parents are perfect. Nobody's. My kids were not raised by perfect people, and they can tell you all the flaws and and struggles of our home and the difficulties, because we're all human. And, and if God blesses you with, uh, if you flirt responsibly, which I've never heard in church before, but if you flirt responsibly and God blesses you with a marriage and blesses you with kids, I guarantee you, no matter how much you try, you will not be a perfect parent. And there are things that parents pass on to their kids. There are patterns, and even that awkwardness of hugging today probably comes down a couple of generations in my family, for all I know. And it, it, it affects, and we do make a difference, parents, on our kids. And some of you have some of the strengths of your parents, but some of you have the weaknesses of your parents. I have the weaknesses of my parents. I can see it. I can see in my kids some of my flaws that I hope they'd never get. As a matter of fact, you know, there's a part of psychology that says we look at the parent or the, 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 the uh, person older than us, a grandparent, somebody that we just didn't like, that had a lot of flaws and brokenness and maybe even alcoholism or abuse or habitual sin or something, and we say, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, and we focus on it so much, guess what happens? We get that. We all live in a broken world, and we're all raised by broken people, and we all carry with us from the generations before some of the the fingerprints of their own problems, mistakes, and sins. And the scriptures actually speak about this. And tonight, I want to talk as you continue in this series on pillow talk, and I'm glad I wasn't given some of the subjects that it sounds like they're handling and I was given something else. But if you open your Bibles, you have a Bible or you have a mobile device with a Bible app, go to Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. I want you to see several verses, but I want you to just go there because we're, we're going to get some of the key principles that I want to talk about tonight with you from there. Tonight, I want to talk about generational curses, generational curses, finding hope and freedom in Christ. The scriptures actually speak about how patterns can be passed on to the next generation, how, how sins and habits, addictions, those kinds of things can be passed on. The scriptures recognize that long before science said that some of these things are part of our DNA some of the, the weaknesses and failures and sins of our lives and patterns can be seen in generations prior to us, sometimes even generations we didn't know. 
But as Moses is given the Ten Commandments by God, the first commandment is, you shall have no other God before you. I am the Lord your God. I'm it. And then there's this interesting little thing there. Before the second commandment is given, there's this thing that gets inserted in Exodus 20 and verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, do you notice there it says, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation, verse 5 says, of those who hate me. That seems a little unfair, doesn't it? (laughs) For God to hold us accountable for something that's gone on in our parents' lives, our grandparents' lives. It even seems unfair that we would be born with those struggles and weaknesses and that we don't just develop our own. In Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, the, the law is repeated after the first tablets are broken. God writes the commandments again on fresh tablets for Moses, and it's again repeated as the law is given again. Exodus 34, verse 6, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. That's so beautiful about God, right? Such a forgiving God, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. In Numbers 14, 18, Moses repeats it to that generation as they are turned away from the promised land. They begin their 40 years of wandering because they wouldn't go into the promised land. And there is this statement in Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And finally, 40 years later, as they're now going to move into the promised land, they're trusting God by faith, but Moses can't move in because of some of his rebellion against God, even in his leadership. He doesn't move in, but he repeats in Deuteronomy the law again to them, and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, we read, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, for a while in our world, it was really popular to say there was a a lot of spiritual life movement going on about 20, 30 years ago, and it was very popular to say the devil made me do it. Matter of fact, there was a comedian in the early 70s when I was a real little kid. I thought he was really funny. He had his own show. His name was Flip Wilson. And his whole little, like the, the line, the kind of the catchphrase that came out of the Flip Wilson show was, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. He was always saying, the devil made me do it. He wasn't responsible. And, and soon after the movement, it kind of we moved more from the spiritual warfare movement in the church and in culture, and we moved into more of the therapy and counseling, which there's great value there. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. I'm not downing either of these, but it became, it's my parents' fault, my parents' fault, my parents' fault. And in both cases, it, it was a way to push the blame on somebody else and they not take responsibility for our own lives. So what is this generational curse that God is going to somehow punish the third and fourth generation for the sins of their fathers and their mothers and their grandmothers and grandfathers. Well, I want us to see that God demonstrates, this this is the statement I want us to focus on, God demonstrates his unbelievable love and amazing grace by breaking the shackles of generational curses. God breaks the shackles of the habitual sin, of the abuse, of the addiction, that can be broken according to God's amazing grace and love. We're not trapped in patterns of sin just because our parents were in those sins. We don't have to feel like we can never escape those things. Now, I want to give you a couple of views of generational curses, and one that I think is a flawed view and, and, and can get us distracted from what it means to live in love like Jesus as we grapple with the generational curses of dealing with the sins and patterns of the generations before us that come out in our lives, whether it be patterns of greed, patterns of lust, patterns of pride. 
View number one is God holds you guilty for your parents' and grandparents' sin and dooms you to repeat their sins and mistakes. Now, there's some truth to this, but it's an oversimplification of what a generational curse is. And so this is not the view I hold. That's not the view I'm going to teach you. But if you don't dig deeper and see generational curses in the passages I've mentioned to you in light of all of Scripture, especially comparing the Old Testament law and the curse of the law to the grace that's found in Christ, you you can get overwhelmed and just say, it's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my grandparents' fault. I, I see these same traits in them, and now I'm bearing on the weight of this same problem, and I'm hurting people I care about because I've carried those same things into my life. This idea that God holds you guilty for your parents' and grandparents' sin and dooms you like God himself curses you, you must live in this sin. God never curses anybody to say they must live in this sin. That's not the God of grace. But sometimes people will get this and then it becomes, I am trapped, it's my parents' fault, and I can't escape this. And then it can come to this point where you say, man, I'm so messed up in my life. I don't know if I want to have kids. And it doesn't have to do with it doesn't have to do with maybe some of the struggles we see in the world and the dangers in the world and the problems of the world, the confusion. It has to do with we're worried that the stuff that we've gone to therapy for, the stuff we've had to grow through with Christian friends speaking into our life and pastoral counsel and wise counsel that we've grown through and we're still struggling with, that uh oh, maybe the way to break the cycle is never have kids. And there are some people who think that way. Sometimes after you've had kids, you think that way. <laughs> Not me, though. I love all three of my kids greatly and wouldn't change anything for the world. But let me share some of the myths that are associated with this wrong view that just says the idea that God holds you guilty for your parents' and grandparents' sin and dooms you to repeat their sins and mistakes. You're trapped and you can't get out of it. There, there are some myths about this kind of generational curse. Number one, the generational curses where you're doomed to sin because your parents sinned in specific ways, they're inevitable. You'll rep- you will repeat your parents' sins and mistakes. You will. You have to because God has cursed you to do that. That's a myth about generational curses. I don't believe that's true. Secondly, that they are unbreaker, unbreakable. Not only will you repeat your parents' sins and mistakes, but your children eventually will repeat Your sins and mistakes, it's an unbreakable cycle that nothing can change. I don't believe that at all either. They're irreversible. Nothing can change the burden of guilt you bear or the pattern of sin passed generationally to you. Nothing can reverse that. You're stuck. You're trapped. It's a very fatalistic, doom-centered approach. Let me just say this, quite frankly, where you find this to be a dominant theology and theme, it often comes from very controlling, top-down leaders who this is another way to use guilt to manipulate and control people. If you just say, you're trapped and I'm the only one who can help you out, (laughs) there's something dangerous about that. Fourthly, the fourth myth about generational curses is they're inescapable. The idea that they take more divine grace and power to overcome the normal sins. In other words, somehow there's got to be a demon released, a curse lifted. There's got to be some supernatural miracle that's going to drive this special kind of sin that is passed generationally from one generation to the other. There's something, it's not normal. It takes extra grace. Jesus had to die a little longer on the cross for these things. No, sin is sin before the eyes of God. But grace is grace, and grace frees and liberates and brings hope, even where sometimes it seems impossible. It seems like you get caught in a cycle, or maybe you deal with addiction because your parents did, or alcoholism. In my own family, I I have some relatives, the generation above me, the generation around me, that have struggled with alcoholism. It's one of the reasons I personally have not tried to even include that much in my life at all, if ever. Some of that's just, I see some some kind of impulses in my heritage and generations that there's something there that I need to be careful of. But these things are not inescapable. They're not irreversible, unbreakable, or inevitable. 
So here's the second view. Let me share the second view with you. This is a view I hold, and I believe is a biblical view in taking the whole of Scripture and understanding these statements in their context. View number two is God helps us identify cycles of behavior that can perpetuate across generations and offers us in, in Christ the means for these cycles to be broken and healed. What he's trying to say here is you've got to make me your God because those generations who turn their back on me, what happens is it affects the third and fourth generation. Parents are going to have an influence over their kids, and it, it will affect the third and fourth generation. And it's good to identify some of the weaknesses. If there's alcoholism, addiction in your family, in your heritage, you need to be careful. Because there may be even something in the genes and biologically that are going to affect that. If you see a lot of lust and sensuality and immorality in generations before you, you got to be careful because you can, even as a child or as a young person, when things you're very impressionable about, about the things of life, you can take those things and pick up those patterns if you're not careful. We're to be aware of these cycles of behavior, habits and patterns and abuses and addictions that easily can be perpetuated from one generation to the other. Praise God, though. God wants to free us, liberate us, and give us joy and hope. We are not trapped by these things. And in Christ, we don't have to be controlled by these things. And we don't have to worry about or believe that the next generation is doomed because of what I've struggled with. We have the liberator Jesus that frees us from the curse. Well, what are some truths about generational curses then? Number one, God does not hold you accountable for the sins of your parents. God does not hold you accountable for the sins of your parents. Now, I've met people, I've dealt with some people where they've got parents who've ended up in prison and ended up in trouble with the law, or they've gotten involved in several affairs and there's broken marriages, and I've met people and even people your age who've faced the heartache of what sin does and the weight of sin and how it overwhelms, and I, I've met people who take that on themselves. I've, I've done counseling over the years as a pastor where I've had grown adults say, my parents went through a divorce when I was six, I still think that divorce was my fault. They carry that burden and that weight but let me just say to you, if maybe you've carried the weight of your parents' divorce or uh, of some sin or some behavior that abuse or addiction, that you have carried the weight of what your parents have done, not just in how it harmed you, but you, you felt some guilt for that, that is their responsibility before God, and they will answer to God, not you, for those decisions and those actions. As a matter of fact, there's a clear statement in Scripture, in Ezekiel 18, 20, it says, the one who sins is the one who will die. And it was talking about capital offenses in the Old Testament. But notice this clarity about sin and sin's responsibility. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. You're going to be responsible for the sin in your own life the lustful wrong behavior, uh, the actions, the thoughts, the responses, the words, you'll be accountable for your life. You'll also be rewarded and celebrated by the Lord for those things that you have done that have blessed and honored and served and benefited people around you, the, the good things. God does not hold you accountable for the sins of your parents. Can I just say again, if you've held some guilt for something about your parents, your grandparents, you've carried on with you, you're not responsible for that. One of the interesting things I've learned in the last, uh, well, maybe it was longer ago than I'm thinking, maybe 20 years ago as a young adult, uh, was that my paternal grandfather uh, worked for the Chicago mob during the days of Al Capone. We even have some family uh, reunions that were Thornton reunions where they would take minutes and they would, you know, they'd vote on a family reunion president and secretary. It was back in the day when that was really cool. Every organization had a president, a secretary, a treasurer. They voted on things, even family reunions. And 
our Thornton reunion in northern Indiana. In some of the minutes, there's a note from Mr. Al Capone of Chicago regrets that he could not join the Thornton family this year for their reunion. Now, I, I know what my grandfather did. He ran an illegal gambling casino behind one of the nicest uh, restaurants in the South Bend, Indiana area, very close to Notre Dame University uh, for a number of years. And uh, that's what he got in trouble for and did and stuff. But, you know, when I get to heaven, I, I, God's not going to say to me, you know, your family had a history there with the mob working for them and doing some things. And I'm not going to be held responsible for those things. Secondly, while not required, expressing remorse for generational sin and its consequences can be helpful. There are times in Scripture you actually see, uh, for example, Daniel, who is a young man when he's taken into captivity, but the people of God are being judged and they're invaded by the Babylonians and, and, and Jerusalem is captured and the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians, all because God's people turned their back. And the, the, the forefathers of Daniel had turned their backs on God and God had brought judgment, but it wasn't Daniel's generation. And yet Daniel, as he prays, he confesses the sins of the generation's voice. And it's not because the weight of guilt was on him, but it was because he needed to express the remorse of what that generation did and how it impacted God's people and the testimony of God in the world in his generation. I even think when it comes to issues like slavery, I don't think it's wrong for one generation to say, that was wrong, that was sinful. And I'm broken for any part of my heritage that was a part of that. There's, there's a pattern in Scripture that says, that, well, it's not required because we're not responsible, we don't carry the guilt before God. There's something healthy that helps us in this generation today to recognize how the impact of sin in lives before us do impact us and those around us. Thirdly, when it comes to the truths about generational curses, God does not doom you to repeat the sins and mistakes of your parents and grandparents. God doesn't doom anyone to be an addict. God doesn't doom anyone to be an abuser. God doesn't doom anyone to be caught up in a pattern of sensual or sexual immorality. God doesn't doom. That's not what God does. We have enough in our own weakness of the flesh and then the temptations of the world's philosophy and then the work of Satan to stir up the world's philosophies and things to appeal to our flesh. God's not a part of that dooming us to sin. He's seeking to liberate us from sin. That's why he sent Jesus. That's what grace is about. Fourthly, it's natural for patterns of sin to pass generationally. Like I said, even sometimes, I mean, there, quite frankly, when it comes to my mom and dad, there are specific patterns I did not want to be a part of my life as a parent or as a man, as a person. And as the older I get, the more I'll say, oh my goodness, that was my dad coming out. The more I look like him. It's just the natural part of that. I've seen it in my own kids. I've seen how in my own kids, the parental sins and habits and behaviors that are wrong come out in my own children. I remember our oldest, John, who's about 30 years old. He was probably three years old. We lived in a house at the time where the steps went down and then turned, but there was a landing there. And uh, I was at the top of stairs and I was telling him it was time to come to bed and it's bedtime, and there was something going on in the family room down there on TV or something. He did not want to go to bed. And he made it very clear he did not want to go to bed. And so he started screaming and throwing a fit. And I came down, and he's screaming and throwing a fit. And he's crying. And he's like almost, he's so angry. He's almost not intentionally, but holding his breath. And he's beating his fists on the wall. He doesn't want to go down. And it was so clear as I'm coming down the steps, I could see in him. I saw it so clearly. His mother came out in him so clearly in that moment. <laughs> Hopefully she's not watching tonight. <laughs> Hopefully she's busy. Now, you know, you, I watch my kids. I see the things they picked up from me. I see the things in my own life I picked up from my parents. But it doesn't mean my kids are doomed. It doesn't mean I'm doomed. It means we need to be aware of patterns we've learned and seen, some things that could be in our genes, in the brokenness of sin and that what gets passed on in broken humanity. 
So how do we break the shackles of generational curses? Now, again, I don't think, as I said, the right view is that God helps us identify these cycles as he's talking about this. Cycles of behavior that can perpetuate across generations, but he offers us in Christ the means for these cycles to be broken and healed. We are not being held guilty by God for our parents' and grandparents' sin and doomed by God to repeat their sins and mistakes. But how do we get free? How many of you, now you're, you're old enough now, how many of you have ever done something, said something, reacted in such a way, you went, oh no, that was my mom or my dad, and that was part of what I didn't want. Thank you for your honesty. How many of you would even be so honest to say, man, I've really wrestled with some stuff that I did, didn't want to pick up from my parents? Yeah. So how do we break those kinds of things that seem to carry on into us? And then what do we do? In a minute, I just want to talk about, then what do we do when you think about, is it worth having kids eventually in this world after you flirt responsibly and get married responsibly and all that good stuff? <laughs> how, how, what do we do? How do you break the shackles of generational curses? Number one, understand that Jesus' sacrifice broke all of the curses of the law. See, the Old Testament law, the whole reason God gave it was to demonstrate that none of us can live up to the holy standard of God. God said, okay, you want to try to live up to who I am? Here are hundreds of moral, civil, and ceremonial laws. You, my people, Israel, you try to live up to these things. No one could. Those who were saved in that generation were looking forward to the hope of the promised one that was coming. That's what they were saved by, not living up to the righteousness of the law, because nobody could. James 2.10 says, if you're guilty of one little point in the law, you're guilty of it all before a holy God. So the Old Testament itself condemns. And Jesus said, I came and I'm the only one who could fulfill that law. I lived it out perfectly in my life. And now I have come not to destroy the law, but fulfill it and he fulfilled it for you and for me. And we put our faith in Jesus, our sin that was placed on Jesus on the cross provides the payment for our sin. And we put our faith in Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, is placed on us. He is the great liberator. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole to die. He took the curse in his death, burial, and resurrection so we wouldn't have to take the curse of the penalty of our sins. He took the curse so we wouldn't be guilty before God and we would be liberated to live in righteousness and not sin. He took the curse so that we could develop patterns of righteousness as we walk from the old self and the patterns of sin. The curse has been broken. Now, I want to go back to the very first verses I share with you that go back to the Ten Commandments and that first commandment, Exodus 20 and verse 5. It says, in Exodus 20 and verse 5, you shall not bow down to them, false gods, or worship them, for I, the Lord, am your God, and I am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. I, I looked at all kinds of references. I went to ChatGPT and said, give me all the verses. I love ChatGPT. This message was provided to you by ChatGPT. No, it wasn't. But it's a great resource, and and I asked ChatGBT, give me all the Bible verses dealing with generational sin, and it gave me all these that I gave you and some others. But what I was looking for when I asked it that was I wanted to know if it would stop at verse 5 or if it would include verse 6 in Exodus 20. It stopped at verse 5. This is where artificial intelligence is not divine intelligence. <laughs> because you have to see verse 6. He says three or four generations are going to feel the weight of that perpetuating of sinful behavior. But notice what verse six says. Verse six says, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Notice, even in the Old Testament, he's saying, yes, the weight of one generation's sin and habits and behaviors will be felt into the next generation, the next generation, and even to the next generation. Unless you turn and look to me and only me as your God and walk in my love and my commandments. And for those who do, he says, it's going to be a thousand generations of my love and kindness. See what he's trying to say here? He's talking three or four generations 
it's funny to me that we've developed uh, the generational curse theology without ge- developing the generational grace theology. A thousand generations of love. And that brings us hope. It brings us hope that if you raised your hand, as God grows you and transforms you in Christ, he's unleashing in you something that generations to come can experience for a thousand generations. It's much more powerful, the grace of God, than the curse of sin. Secondly, not only do we understand that Jesus' sacrifice broke all of the curses of the law, curses of, uh, curses of the law, but secondly, acknowledge any patterns of sin you may have picked up from your parents. My dad watches YA. He actually likes this service more than the one I preach at. It's quite a long story, and he often tells me this when I visit. I love YA. I'm like, why, Dad? Can't you watch YouTube and see ours too? I skip those. I watch YA. <laughs> He's 77 years old, and he's my father, and he doesn't watch on the Sunday services as much as he watches YA. So I'm not going to tell you what those sins are that I identify came from my father and my mother, because he'll watch even less of the 9 and 11 then. But we all can see the weaknesses, the character flaws, those things that we picked up in whatever way it was perpetuated into our generation— It's okay to acknowledge those before the Lord. It's okay to acknowledge those with a Christian brother or sister, with with a Christian counselor or someone speaking into your life. Because it's good to get that out in the open. (laughs) You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, the whole idea of that is if we say the same thing as God says about it, instead of God calls it sin and we go, ah, it's not really sin, it's kind of like error in a way, it's kind of, call sin, sin before God. If there's something you see that you feel like or sense or believe has come as a result of the generation or generations before, just name that. Then live a life of repentance regarding these sins, just like any other sin in your life. Even if there's a sin in your life that you can't look at and see in your parents, then look and say, you know what? The same way as I confess that sin, I I bathe in the, the, the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of Jesus, you, you live a repentant life, not just to come to Jesus as Savior, where you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ, but then that's a pattern of your whole life, that when you see the sin, you repent of it and you turn to Christ. And only those who are t- tr- truly born from above, born in Jesus, can live that pattern of life. Where we say no to sin and we seek Christ, and we say no to sin and we seek Christ. One of the dangers we have is we, I, I, I'm like you, man. I've lived a longer life, so I've probably confessed some of the same sins more than you've confessed. I go back to God and I say, oh man, I gotta confess this again, Lord. It's been something that's plagued me my whole life and I've stepped in it again. I did it again, I said it again, I thought it again. I reacted that way again. It wasn't Christ-like. But what's great about our God is you can keep coming back. The grace never runs out. The grace never runs out. He will constantly forgive you. And what I found in my own life is my battle with sin, whether it's my own normal sins or it's something that I believe came through generations before me, the the Christian life is, for me, three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, three, I feel like I'm dancing, three steps forward, two steps back. You see the progress that's being made? But a lot of Christians get all upset. Oh no, it was two steps back, it's over. I've confessed this before, oh my goodness, and we get overwhelmed. Just go back to the grace of God, ask him to grow you. And when you look back, you get to somewhere near my age and you look back over several decades, you go, wait a minute, look what God did. I'm still grappling with this, but not as often, not as deep. I'm much more aware of it. The Holy Spirit, I hear the Holy Spirit say, there you go again. Or the Holy Spirit, as I'm being tempted, don't go that way. (laughs) It's a pattern of life. It's a life of repentance regarding these sins. Embrace the freedom and hope found in being a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, not just if anyone who had really good parents, anyone who had really good Christian parents, not just anyone who had really good Christian parents who didn't pass on any bad things, but if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. Embrace that, even as you confess 
those things you wrestle with that may even be a part of what has been perpetuated into your life and your family through those before you. Embrace the freedom and hope found in being a new creation of Christ. And fifth and finally, how do you break the, sh the shackles of a generational curses? You share with your children about generational patterns of sin and the path to freedom and hope. As you flirt responsibly, <laughs> get married responsibly. I'm never going to forget that phrase here. <laughs> Although I shouldn't, by the way, unless it's my wife. That would be the most responsible way for me. Um, the, as, as God would see fit and you would find the right partner for life and God would bless you with children. Don't be afraid that that child is doomed to go to therapy because you did. Don't be afraid that that child is doomed to struggle with the same sins that have been overwhelming and sometimes crushed you in life so you just don't want to have any kids or what you saw from your parents, you don't want that to show up again in another generation, even if you've been wrestling with it and found some victory in it. What you do is you just be honest with them. I'll tell you, as a parent, the hardest thing for me to do is to apologize to my kids. I don't know why. If someone had said me that, told me that when I was your age or before I got married uh, as a single young adult, and they'd said, you know, one day it'll be really hard for you to apologize to your kids, I would say, no, it won't. I love Jesus. I want to be transparent with them but there is something really weird about it. If I like was too, I was uh, reacted too harshly in anger with my kids one night when we got in the car to drive to school the next day, I would sit there going, okay, just say, daddy was not right last night. <laughs> that was wrong in the anger he showed in that moment, forgive me. And I would wrestle with like, and then as they're getting out of the car to go to school, daddy is, was wrong last night, you know, because... <laughs> But I don't know why that's so hard. And I think that's part of the generational curse is it, it takes not only humility to deal with our sin, but it takes humility to disciple our children. And what I've learned through my own parents, one of the great things I learned from my parents and all the brokenness of our home and the struggles we had, as I said, my mom and dad loved Jesus, served Jesus. They're active in the local church. They served in so many ways. I saw the trajectory of my parents' life in the midst of all kinds of chaos and hell in our home all through my upbringing, and the trajectory I saw in the midst of that was mom and dad love Jesus. They're not perfect people. They're trying to follow Jesus. They're trying to serve Jesus. They're trying to do their very best to bring him honor and glory. And when my book came out, several of my friends said to me, why did you and Troy not walk away from the church? My dad was pretty honest with me about his sins and his failures and his foibles. He didn't, he didn't try to look holy spiritual in the car on the way home from church. He would actually talk about his own walk with the Lord, not in some deep spiritual way. He'd just say, what the pastor said is really hard to do at the factory where I work. I watched the, tra the trajectory of my parents' lives aim at Jesus. And, and so I want to just say a, a few things to you about um, how, you, how you could think about, dream about, pray about God providing you a family one day and not be afraid of not just the stuff in this world that can be scary, but the stuff that maybe you've got in your life that you don't want to pass on. I just want to say a few things about that. Just three things. If you want to get ready to be, as God would bless you and see fit, the best kind of parent you could be to your children and not pass on and perpetuate sinful behaviors into the next generation and beyond, then what you do right now is you walk with God. Now. You just become a good man of God, a good woman of God who walks with God daily. Now, before you're married, before you have kids, even while you're learning to flirt responsibly, be a godly person now. Walk with God. Secondly, worship God. You see, do you remember what I told you where this command is that it keeps repeating with the same command? It's command number one, have no other gods before you. Worship weekly here that you do at YA that we do on the weekend nine, at 9 and 11 and Saturday night at 6. That worship is aligning our hearts to God to make sure there are no other gods in our lives. To refocus and say, he is God, this stuff isn't, and I am not. He is God. Walk with God. Worship God. And then can I just suggest, just grow in the wisdom of God. Learn through life. Learn through your errors 
As you confess your sin, look for the patterns. Ask someone to hold you accountable. Find a Christian friend or two or a small group here in YA that's going to speak into your life to help you walk in the righteousness of Christ so you can develop wisdom for life. If even that interests you, one of the things I did as a young adult that I was challenged to do for one year, I took the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. It's just a collection of wise sayings, hundreds of wise sayings that God, through his spirit, inspired to be put in scripture that are just everyday practical things. And someone challenged me to every month, just on, what is today, the 20th? You would read the chapter in Proverbs number 20. Tomorrow I'll read chapter 21, the next day read chapter 22. And all I did each time through is I would pick one verse out of the whole chapter that jumped out at me that I wanted to think about, mull over, try to put into my life that day. It deals with friendship, money, sex, temptation, family, friendships, hopes, dreams, pride, lust, health. I mean, it's all in the Proverbs. But can I just tell you, you don't have to be fearful about what might come in the generation that God would use you to bring into the world. You don't have to be fearful. You can be faithful to God in your walk with him now, in your worship of him now, and growing in wisdom now, so that it'll equip you if God in his sovereignty would bless you with children one day, to be the kind of parent who understand, no, that generational curse doesn't mean I'm doomed or my kids are doomed. It just means I got to pay attention. There can be some things that are perpetuating. But those things, those curses can be broken by the same grace that takes care of any sin and that saves any person. It's the grace found in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is maybe that you wrestle with, that you feel came, or maybe you're just beginning to understand as a young adult came from your parents that's coming out in you. Maybe it's an addiction problem. Maybe it's a habitual sin. Maybe it's an anger issue that just matches or a pride issue. Or I don't know what it is, but can I encourage you? You're not doomed by that. The grace of God is stronger than the curse of sin. And if you know Jesus, you can walk in freedom and hope, even if you're struggling with some of the stuff that may have been perpetuated into your life generationally. And you're free as you look forward to what God might do in your life and might bless you with a family one day. You're free in that you can help your kids find freedom too in Jesus. The grace of God is stronger than the curse of sin. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that you are a God who knows our humanity, our brokenness, that we were born with our backs to you, a bent toward sin, and that in the family settings we grow up, there are a lot of good things that can happen, but there are a lot of bad things that can happen, things that are done to us, things that we witness, characteristics and qualities that get perpetuated from one generation to another. And I pray for folks right now in the room who really have wrestled with that. Maybe they've even sought counsel and input from friends and therapists and pastors and others. And I, I pray that they would find your grace sufficient to break all and any curses that come from sin. Father, I pray for those who perhaps are just beginning to discover how hard it can be to break free of some of these patterns. Maybe they've been overwhelmed by they confess it, they forsake it, they get caught in it again. May they know your grace never runs out. That as your children, we come to you. You are always faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for that kind of grace and love. It doesn't make sense to us from a human standpoint, but thank you. Father, I pray that if some of the stuff they've gone through in life has caused any of them to have seeds of fear about the future, about their careers or their lives or potential marriages or families or children, 
May they know that when they walk with you and they worship you and they seek your wisdom, that you'll equip them not to be perfect parents or perfect spouses or perfect citizens, perfect friends, but people whose lives have a trajectory that points to Jesus. I pray, Father, for those who may be beating themselves up a lot over sin in their life. May your spirit whisper your grace to them now. May they confess that sin. May they find themselves accountable to others. May they reach out to somebody to help them find a way to overcome what they're going through, what they're struggling with. Thank you, Father, for the amazing grace of God. Thank you that your grace is greater than any curse of sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.